is Michael Burns, the vice chairman of Lionsgate. Great to see you, Michael. Thanks so much for joining us. John, thanks for having me today. And I don't want to be too premature here, but I do want to say congratulations because I believe in March will be 20 years uh, as the vice chairman of Lionsgate. It's a long time. Well, <laughs> so, yeah, it's been a couple decades. A long time, and I mean, an epic in, in terms of media, uh, because that a lot has obviously changed over the last 20 years. I want to start there. Um, we, we see a revolution when it comes to streaming television almost every single week. Uh, too many shows to watch, but obviously, Lionsgate has been out in the forefront of that. The Stars Network, obviously important in, in the global landscape of television. But talk to us, Michael, kind of generally on how you see the streaming wars shaping up, because it does seem to be some consolidation there and audiences are making a lot of decisions. I think it'll be five or six uh, uh, streaming services in bundles, but it's not necessarily video only. I think what you'll see is a, is basically a redo of what happened in the cable business years and years ago, which is the, the bundles were put together and, and made those, those bundles made things easy for the consumer. So I think what you'll see is you'll see two or three video services bundling with a potential music service, as well as a couple of other uh, uh, streaming services. So that's, that to me looks like that's what the future is going to be. And I think uh, we're very well positioned, uh, stars, because we've got a we're focused on a, a very large underserved market, whether it be women or African Americans, the gay and lesbian community. The idea is stars has quality shows that that a lot of other services want to be part of a bundle. Yeah, I mean, Lionsgate has always been kind of on the forefront of those issues with films like Precious just come to mind. You know, that's you get uh, Orange is the New Black, one of the big success stories for Lionsgate in the past. Uh, I do want to ask you, too, about, you know, the, the way the consumer is coming into play here, because obviously they demand a lot of choices now. And do you think they will stand for that, uh, these being kind of put back into bundles? Because one of the things that the trends that, that seems to be pre prevalent these days is the consumer demand, really them driving uh, what's what happens. I don't think that necessarily they'll sign up for a bundle, but if they get the right price point and it's two or three, four or five services that they want and they get uh, that bundle at a price point that they feel is a, a good bargain, I think that'll lower, lower churn and I think that consumers will want that. However, uh, you'll also see, and we're seeing it a lot of it today, which is people just signing up through Amazon or Apple or going direct to stars and just picking up the service individually or a la carte with their cable company. Yeah, choice is key. And, you know, obviously this is reflected. Uh, Newsmax, we have fortunately seen a lot of ratings growth since uh, the election. Uh, you know, people demand more options now. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about some of these rumors we hear about Trump starting his own television network. Do you think that could be successful? I do think it could be successful. Uh, I think that, look, you, you, the, the president has a rabid uh, fan base. And you know, if you if you look at sort of just look at the crowds he was drawing, even towards the end of the election, uh, with COVID uh, sort of you know running out of control, people were still taking risks and showing up. And so, do I think this guy has an audience? I think the president has a huge audience. And you know, Oprah has a huge audience too. Uh, she has her own network. Would it be something comparable to that? I don't know if he does his own network. I don't think that's ultimately what he does. But again, it's hard to hard to guess. Uh, but I think he'll be a force to be reckoned with for for some time, even uh, even post uh, uh, exiting the seat at uh, in, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Certainly, you can see him. You know, with, with the way streaming works, he could finance special projects. He could do you know limited series things like that. So a lot of options here. And Michael, you're you're a Republican, longtime Republican, obviously uh, in the minority in the entertainment world. What is that like for you? Well, I, I feel a little bit like I'm a man without a party. I'm a moderate Republican, mm -hmm. so I guess I'd put myself in the uh, Susan Collins camp, uh, who's a, a close friend of mine. I think that again that moderates on both sides, it's very difficult uh, to get moderates elected, although I do believe that the world will move towards that. Um, when you have the, the fringes on both sides, and I think that the problem is the primary season where what happens is that you don't have moderates that typically vote in primaries, so you end up with candidates on the, on the far right or the far left uh, for the general election. I mean, that happened in California. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that this fellow by the name of Tom Campbell should have been a U.S. senator. And what happened way back when was uh, he was defeated in a in a primary by Bruce Hershenson. I don't remember if you remember him, an ABC commentator, very far right at the time. 
And what happened is uh, he was defeated in the primary and then Barbara Boxer came in and, and took that seat. That should have been a Republican seat. Yeah, I, you see this happening across the country. You can look at the Rio Grande Valley in Texas and South Florida as well. You had Republicans picking up seats the Democrats thought were in their win column. I do think you see, if not a return to moderation, maybe a return to more rational thought from Republicans realizing uh, that these kind of political fault lines, I call them, where, the, where their races are still contested, uh, that you know, common sense solutions that appeal to all of America are really the best path forward. Yeah, yeah, it's funny you say that. We, my partner and I, John Feldheimer, talked about a common sense party. Uh, you also have a situation, you know this, John, you have people vote on one issue. Mm -hmm. And whether it's gun control or uh, a woman's right to choose or uh, fiscal responsibility, but you, that you have one issue that they'll vote on. And, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of people don't look at the big picture. So we really need to move more to the center. And, and I believe the Republican Party has a very good chance if you take a look at how many seats were picked up, even you know in California, believe it or not, uh, I think the Republican Party has a, a great opportunity, particularly with the Hispanic market, if they actually get their act together on the immigration issue. That is the that's the question. I mean, you know, everybody would like to see the whole entire Congress really stepping up to the plate because Congress doesn't seem to want to touch this issue when it comes to immigration. You know, what do you see as the solution when it comes to immigration? Well, you know this, I wrote an op-ed piece for you guys years ago, which is the idea of uh, putting people that have been here for a number of years, sponsored by American families, and even charged them for the ability um, to, to get on that path to citizenship, which is, it's ridiculous. You've got probably 11, 12, 15 million undocumented workers in this country that want to uh, be taxpayers, that want to not be afraid to be deported. And I believe there is a prescriptive easement that we know these people are here, and the fact that they have to live in the shadows, I think that's a giant uh, uh, mistake. And I think that we have an opportunity as a country to have them, you know, join uh, America as maybe not American citizens to begin with, but certainly to get them on a path uh, to become an American citizen and they want to. And so I think what the idea is of giving them green cards, giving them the opportunity uh, to, uh, again, get out of the shadows, that's what we need to do. And the Republican Party should be going uh, for these people. They should be, in many ways, uh, really focusing on the demographic. Look what happened in Miami-Dade uh, in the Florida election this year, in the presidential election. Uh, there's an opportunity for Hispanic voters. And George W. got very close with the DREAM Act of, of getting legislation through. And maybe Joe Biden will get it, uh, get through this year or this uh, in the next few years on the immigration side. But I believe that should be a bipartisan issue. And that Hispanic is the fat, the Hispanic voting bloc is the fastest growing demographic in the country, and, and people have to focus on them. No, it's, there's no question about it. We did see record gains for the Republican Party this election cycle, partly by reaching out to them on those you know, social issues, family uh, first types of issues. But you're absolutely right. We do see these exploding demographics in certain parts of the country and people living off the books. I think most people would agree that if these folks are going to be here and they're going to continue to be here for years and years, they should at least come out of the shadows, get on the books. A lot of them pay taxes anyway, uh, but we want to see it done in a, in a more outward and transparent way. Let's talk a little bit about California specifically, because this is, again, one of those places where you saw Republicans pick up some seats there. You guys are living with these very restrictive lockdown orders. How is Gavin Newsom doing in California, and how is it affecting the film industry? Well, we don't shoot a lot of television shows or feature films in California. I wish we would, but, uh, or wish we could, but there are not no subsidies, and there's no incentives to really shoot here to, to speak of. So we end up shooting in different states. I mean, the lockdowns, it, it's sort of awful what's happening. And, and unfortunately, it's the, you know, if you take a look at what happened last week with, you know, restaurants being closed down again, it's the, it's, it's the, it's the, uh, uh, it's terrible for, you know, waiters and busboys and people working in the kitchen. And, and what happens is, and then going all the way through retail, uh, it has created, you know, havoc here. And everybody wants the, uh, a pandemic, pandemic too slow, uh, but some of these lockdowns, they're you know, in one week we're locked down, the next week we're not. It's uh, it's it's not being particularly well uh, orchestrated. You know, you mentioned that uh, about how a lot of television shows are not shot in uh, Los Angeles anymore or in California. You see Georgia at the end of a lot of credits now. And we've seen this kind of transition from California to Georgia when it comes to the film industry. Why is that? 
Well, because Georgia and New Mexico and New York, for that matter, uh, they incentivize us to shoot there. They figured out uh, if you really do the math, even though they say, well, they're giving us called a 20 percent a subsidy for a show shot there. If you take a look at the taxes, income taxes that are paid there, and then all the cottage industries around these shoots, uh, they, the states are way better off uh, by giving the subsidies. And California hasn't figured that out for whatever reason. Yeah, Florida kind of had the same thing. They, they ended a lot of their subsidies for filming and a lot of production left the state. A lot of it has moved to Georgia, New Mexico and other states that are friendly for other reasons as well. But it is interesting, Michael, I think when you look at the whole landscape of the media industry as a whole, we've also talked a lot about the influence that the media has had over this election. Do you see the inherent bias? Because uh, some of the polling we've seen shows that both Democrats and Republicans believe that the media is biased in favor of Democrats. I think there's no question about that. Um, it, it's it's uh, whether it's CNN or the Washington Post or the, the New York Times. I think they're certainly left leaning. I don't think anybody with a brain would, would tell you otherwise. And you know, Fox has been right leaning for quite some time, and now you've got an opportunity at Newsmax, I think, to uh, to capture a lot of you know to be right of Fox. Yeah. And uh, and so I think that there there is it's very difficult to get unbiased news. And it is very difficult in many cases to get the truth, but there's no question about uh, the fact that the, the media is left uh, uh, biased. Yeah, and that's becoming painfully obvious to everyone. And the question is, what do you do about it? The other question too is, how do you regulate uh, big tech? Because uh, more and more, Google and Facebook have an influence over the media that we do see. And I was just wondering, from your perspective as the vice chairman of Lionsgate, how do you view kind of this undue? Uh, influence of big tech we see over our media industry and this section 230 a lot of people say it's time to rip that out by the roots I think there is a lot of momentum towards more regulation I mean when you have big tech uh, censoring uh, news stories that's not a good thing and so you know they've, there's a expression that's been around forever absolute power corrupts absolutely now um, that bias can work both ways, and the influence of big tech can, is obviously a, 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 a giant factor in elections. Um, but if you go back to when Donald Trump got elected in 2016, I could easily make the argument that Facebook uh, had a great deal of responsibility for that because the election was so close, and you know we don't have to we don't have to go into you know all these ads and and and, and whatnot when when they come to came to the uh, election results in 2016. But obviously, uh, when you have this enormous power, the uh, and and know what people are searching for, know what to uh, uh, to to put in front of people. I, I watched this Netflix uh, documentary the other day. If you haven't seen it, it's, oh, it's chilling. The, I know exactly what you're it, talking about. The social it, dilemma. It, it, everybody has to see it. it. It's mandatory watching for everyone. In particular, if you have children, I have three young boys, you realize the influence of this, you know, it becomes almost like a brainwashing of sorts because mm -hmm. you click here and you click here and you click here and you create create this chain of, uh, of propaganda in many cases because, the, again, that's how the tech companies are um, profiting because of the ads that are served uh, on and on keep, keeping people online as long as possible and serving up things. Uh, serving, up, serving up the exact same things that they think people are, are interested in because they know their search engine, uh, knows their search history, and it is chilling. Well, Michael, I uh, wanted to wrap up by asking you this question. Uh, what do you think will be the biggest media trend of 2021? I think you will see consolidation. I think you will see streamlining. I think that streaming is here to stay. I think uh, if I were going to say that, uh, I, I think there are going to be four, five, six big video winners in the streaming space. I think uh, the linear uh, television is going to be in a difficult spot. I think movies will come back. If I had to tell you when, I would say they'll be back robustly uh, when the vaccine is proven and people are taking it. So I would say that that's uh, summer of 21. But again, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, but I think people are ready to get out of the house. And I think they're uh, uh, ready to go back to the movie theaters. I think that'll be a big business. I also think you're going to see uh, the window splitting in the in the uh, uh, in the in the marketplace. In that you'll see shorter windows. You'll you take a look at what uh, Universal Universal's done with making some uh, some deals with the theaters as far as shorter windows. And if you're not in a thousand screens, and you know you can you can move to a faster uh, uh, release in in different uh, electronic sell through or premium VOD or VOD. I think that's going to continue to happen. And 
ultimately the consumer, the customer gets what they want when they want it at the price point they want it. So that's going to continue to happen. And I think that you're going to, you're going to, as I said before, I think you will see uh, consolidation in space. Michael Burns, thanks so much. John, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. And Michael, real quick, we're still rolling. I wanted to ask you one more question because we're putting together sure. some stuff for the end of the year here. Give me your favorite Lionsgate. You're probably going to make a lot of people mad, but you can say your favorite Lionsgate thing. We're, we're asking people what you're watching, what you're reading, what you're listening to uh, for the end of the year. So just give me some examples of what you are watching Lionsgate and some other stuff that's not Lionsgate that you've been really impressed with, if you, if you don't mind. Well, look, I, I thought I thought Hightown on Stars is tremendous. It takes place on Cape Cod. It's the underbelly of uh, what what goes on there, and it is uh, it's uh, it's violent, uh, but it's a terrific show. Uh, what am I reading? I'm reading uh, Red Notice, which is a true story. Which I think they're making it into a movie. I think Ryan Reynolds is going to be in that. But I'd say it's a it's not our movie, but the book is uh, spectacular. And what am I listening to? I I I, uh, I love this uh, this Taylor Swift album that she did uh, while she was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm not I laughing because I'm making fun of you, but I'm right there with you. I have a nine-year-old daughter, and I, I'm impressed with it. And uh, kudos to Disney because I just watched the new concert. Uh, I haven't, I haven't seen that, the making of the album, but I heard it's, uh, it's great. Yes, it's great. One of the things we have to get used to. Um, there's some language in there, but you know, it's too late. You can't catch up with your kids. I, I, so you I have know, to explain. I, be like, don't you say that word, even though Taylor Swift says it. But it's a great. I know. Album. I know exactly. I know exactly what you're talking about when she <laughs> says, you know, are, you know, are you going to go tell me to, you know, f myself? It was like a little shocking, but uh, uh, Taylor Swift has grown up, and she is an unbelievable voice. Yeah, and the great writing of the songs. Um, I'm going to get embarrassed because my, my producers are never going to let me hear the end of this in my fandom for Taylor Swift. But, Michael, I could talk to you all day. Thank you so much. Look forward to doing it again. John, thank you, and, and good luck with, uh, with uh, Newsmax TV. Thank you. Newsmax TV is now America's fastest-growing cable news channel. We give you the real news you need. So subscribe to our YouTube channel and give us a thumbs up. If you like this video, share it with your friends. Newsmax TV streams live on YouTube for free. Newsmax TV, real news for real people.